my, my co-moderator, Dr. Abu Fadel, and I are very honored to be uh, moderating the very last session of uh, the, the meeting. It's been great. It's been wonderful. I think congratulations goes to, 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 to the panel of or organizers. Here we have uh, the chief, uh, Manos Brilakis, uh, on the panel, so we're very fortunate to do that. And there are good doctors, they're good friends, and they do a wonderful job of teaching. So we're going to talk, my co-moderator is going to present the first lecture on femoral axis, uh, my best tips and tricks. So before we do that, please uh, let's do a show of hands. Who are primarily uh, transfemoralists uh, in this uh, audience? Two? Wow. It used to be the other way around. And who are primarily transradialists? Wow, now you have to sell it. No, I just want to teach them how to do femoral now. I hope, I hope, <laughs> I hope you can. Well, thanks so much. All right, well, again, thank you for being here. It's an honor. This meeting has always been a great meeting. And <clears throat> congratulations to the organizers. And thank you for the co-moderator and the panel. So, you know, there's no question that, uh, that all of us are doing more radials, including myself. But also there's no question that the more we do radials, it's very important to keep the basics of doing transferm uh, transfemorals. Because when you need transfemorals, it's going to be the tough cases, the cases with large sheaths, and the cases that needs uh, you know, a little bit more than just the usual PCI. So it's always important to keep this in the back of my, our minds. And additional to this is that if you are in an academic institution and you have fellows, I think like we do, I think it's extremely important to make sure you still teach the fellows right femoral access. There's no question about that. The first tip or trick I'm going to teach you is just use more common sense. You know, I mean, this patient, why would you want to do femoral if you, if you can do radial? So I, I just want to tell you, you know, irrespective of how much you love radial or how much you love femoral, just use your common sense and choose your patients wisely. There's always a, a reason why a patient will do much worse when doing femoral or much worse when doing radial. So the ideal puncture site, you've all heard this many times, <clears throat> and I think you can see the pointer. You want to get this axis when you do femoral right here um, in the middle of the head of the femur approximately so that you have good access and a good bony landmark behind you to get hemostasis if you're not using closure devices. Even though this here in zone two is still considered common femoral artery because it's above the bifurcation, it's not a good area to get access because it's definitely below the femoral head. And even here, even though it's still in front of the, com uh, common fem uh, in front of the femoral head, you're gonna be above the most inferior loop of the inferior epigastric artery. So you may be too high, you may be in the iliac or retroperitoneal. So even though it's still in front of the bone, you don't wanna get access here. These people that get access in this zone here are gonna be the ones that have least complications. They won't have retroperitoneal bleed. The risk of pseudoaneurysms, hematomas are gonna be less. And this has been shown. The first thing I wanna tell you, especially for those who do femorals on a regular basis, and for those of you who don't do femoral on a regular basis and may need some help getting femorals in tough cases, all my tavers I do using this technique as well because all large sheath. So how to do ultrasound guided access or how would, why would it help to do ultrasound guided access? Ultrasound is awesome because it shows you the artery exactly. Whether you have the needle guide or you don't have the needle guide, you'll get to use the ultrasound and a sterile technique. If this is prepared for you before the start of the case, it won't delay you at all. These days, we don't use the 18-gauge the, uh, the needle. We mainly use micropuncture needle with ultrasound. And if you want to use the micropuncture needle, the other tip I'm going to tell you is there are specific micropuncture needles that have kind of laser cuts at the tip of the needle so they make them, you can see them more under ultrasound. So if you're using a micropuncture needle, which is a regular micropuncture, you won't see it very well under ultrasound, but the one that is specifically done for ultrasound, it bounces off the ultrasound waves and you can see it much better going in the artery. So direct visualization is awesome, right? You can see the artery, you can see the bifurcation, you can see the vein, you can see the needle actually entering the anterior wall of the artery, so what else do you want? If there's, if there's disease here, you can go a little bit higher, a little bit lower. But remember, the ultrasound does not actually keep you from going very high, so when you're scanning, it's always good to have a, a landmark under fluoroscopy where the head of the femur is, where do you want to go, not higher, not lower than that, and then use the ultrasound. The other trick I'm going to tell you is that uh, when, you're, when you're using the ultrasound, if you start seeing the artery diving down, then you start to get in the pelvis. You're too high. You don't want to get access there. So you always want to get access where the artery is shallowest. 
And you can see the wire, you can make sure it's not subintimal, you can make sure it's going in the artery or the vein or whatever you want to do. And ideally, you know, if you have somebody like this with very high bifurcation and you know this is going to be a great access site right here, if you don't have previous angiogram to look at it and know this is not a great place to be, uh, the ultrasound can help you get where the star is to get good access. So the goal is, even with the highest bifurcation, you can still try to get above the bifurcation and below the most inferior border of the inferior epigastric artery and get good access, and ultrasound can help you do that. And this was shown in the, in the study we did, and Dr. Sito is here, he can comment as well, uh, where the high bifurcation, really the ultrasound is kind of the way to go, right? It also does not increase your time. Everybody thinks if I'm gonna go do ultrasound, I'm gonna waste five minutes in the cath lab. It actually saves time if it's ready for you before you go. First pass success rate, number of attempts, number of vena puncture, they're all less with ultrasound. So, and complications, hematomas were also seen less. Next take and trip, I'm gonna talk about micropuncture. You know, everybody, I hear people say there's not enough data to, to know a micropuncture is safe. And that's true, nobody, we've looked at it. I know Manos and I discussed it not a uh, long time ago. I mean, to do a micropuncture study to try and see complications, you need thousands of patients, and it's very hard to do that. But we know some things about you know, micropuncture that actually can help, and some things that are not so good about micropuncture. And people who read the literature a lot can always like, tell you, hey, micropuncture increases retroperitoneal bleed even though it's good. So why does this happen, and how can we avoid it? That's what I want to try and show you today. When you use the micropuncture needle, and this I routinely do, and I ask my fellows to routinely do, just take a very quick one-second fluoro, still frame, before you remove the needle, and try to look at this tip of the needle and wire transition point. This is where your needle entered the artery. This is where you got the blood back and you started advancing the wire. If you like this position and it's where you want it to be, that's perfect, you can proceed. If you don't like it, now is the time to remove the needle, the wire, hold pressure for a minute, it's just a very small hole, and then you can proceed. So this is a live example in the same patient with you know, micropuncture. So I stuck, I looked too high. I just don't like it here. I removed, held pressure, stuck again, looked while the wire is going up, and that we do, and the wire is going here. And that's what why micropuncture can cause retroperitoneal hemorrhage. If you do it blindly and you advance the wire, especially if it's a hydrophilic wire, it's gonna go in these small arteries in the pelvis and can perforate and bleed, especially if you use high, you know, anticoagulation, 2B3As and all this. So just remove the wire and re-advance the wire properly. And here you can see we avoided a very high stick and a possibly a retroperitoneal bleed. We avoided a retroperitoneal bleed here because of traveling of the wire into some crazy arteries and we were able to get good access on the patient. We proceeded. The third thing I want to talk to you about, it's hard to teach femoral axis in eight minutes, but <laughs> the other thing I want to talk to you about is that the femoral angiogram. To me, this is, this is standard of care. I mean, if you want to do femoral, you should look and see what's going on. Some people do it with the micropuncture sheath before they put the big sheath. It's okay, I just don't like to inject without having the pressure transduced, especially with the micropuncture sheet. Sometimes can, it can be against the wall, it can be subintimate, and you inject with a 10 cc syringe without making sure there's a good pressure waveform, you can dissect the whole artery, and we've seen that. It's, and this can exactly happen with something like this. Even if you, see, because of this tortuosity, the tip of the sheet is right here and can dissect this artery. So the other trick I wanna teach you, so you don't get something like this from the sheath, is to always get a wire up and take the femoral angiogram with your wire up and always do the femoral angiogram when the sheath is connected to the manifold or to the assist, whatever you use in your, in your lab. So you can see a good pressure waveform. This is one thing I would like to stress. And the femoral angiogram is important, not only just to tell you if you can do closure device or not. It can show you issues. Like, look at this case here. This is, this is my case when I was a first-year fellow. That's what got me into femoral access and radial access and all access studies that we've done. This is me, and you can tell how many attempts I tried to make to get the artery, right? Every attempt actually caused the laceration in one of these branches here, and the patient was having hematoma in front of our eyes. We didn't need the angiogram to know. But we didn't know if the blood was coming from here, from here. You know, we had to stop the procedure, remove the sheath, hold pressure, and get access on the other side and do the, the thing. This is another reason why you can do femoral angiograms. This is, for example, a sheath that went subintimal, and this is a sheath that you absolutely is very high, you absolutely know this patient, if you remove the sheath in the recovery room, they're gonna bleed to death. 
This is somebody who you need to care for in the cath lab, whether doing closure device with a suture-mediated closure device or going up and over the other side and doing balloon tamponade for the axis side. Uh, just be careful if you have a high stick like this. This is another tip and trick I wanted to show you. Don't use Andrew Seal or collagen plug uh, devices because if you're sticking very high, this collagen plug can get stuck at the muscles of the artery and uh, muscles of the abdominal wall and not uh, give good hemostasis on the arteriotomy side and patients can bleed to death and I've seen one of these cases. So if you have a very high stick and you want to use a closure device, suture mediated closure is the way to go. So take home messages. Choose your patients wisely. Proper techniques and adequate training for both radial and femoral are extremely important. Combine ultrasound and fluoroscopy to look at the tip of the needle and to look at the, like which artery you're going in. Uh, when you use micropuncture, make sure your wire doesn't go into some crazy small arteries in the pelvis. Femoral angiogram on everybody who you're going to go femoral before you upsize and do your tavers and all this, and learn how to deal with complications so that you can get yourself out of trouble. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Mazen. This was an excellent uh, lecture. I think you, you nailed all the important topics and the important points. I think that if, if we're going to do femoral access, I think it's fine. But if you're, but if you're going to do it, you've got to do it following best practices. And I think you outlined most of, um, most of the best practices. Uh, with Manus, we did a survey uh, that we published last year at Ninjak uh, Cardiovascular Interventions, and only un one third of people that uh, does femorals just take the angiogram. A uh, small proportion use the micropuncture, the micropuncture kit. Mostly in this, uh, in, in, in this country, outside of the U.S., there's almost no use of ultrasound or, uh, or, or, femoral, or femoral angiogram. Do you think that femoral, uh, femoral access, um, I'm sorry, femoral ultrasound is mandatory? Well, I would say, like, I make it mandatory for my fellows when they start getting femoral access so that they learn the technique, they know how to do it, and they have the ability to do it whenever it's needed. I think any time... Uh, you have difficult access, decreased pulses, no pulses that you can palpate very well, obese patients, or just any risks that you, know, you think the patient has, the more the bleeding risk, I think it's mandatory, in my opinion, in my lab, to use ultrasound. So we have it available all the time. If you don't want to use ultrasound and you feel comfortable that you can get access without ultrasound by whether fluoroscopy guided or, or landmark guided, I would still urge you guys to use the micropuncture and look at this wire needle tip transition and before you upsize and put a sheath and take an angiogram when you, after you do that. So if for whatever reason you don't want to use an ultrasound, you still have to follow some techniques to make sure you get safe access. The other thing is the use of the needle guide. I think I find it very useful and, I, and, I, and some people say that there's a steep learning curve to ultrasound. If you use the needle guide, the learning curve is gone because you, you go exactly under the ultrasound beam. So Manus has been a very strong femoralist um, for many years. And he actually published a very nice review article in Jack Interventions that also has all the important tips and tricks on, on transfemoral access along with others. I don't want to take credit away from anybody else. Actually, the person who did the work is Jader Sandoval. But I yes, get the credit. He did the work, author. I get the credit, I guess. But, but actually, I, I do believe, I, still, I do most of my cases uh, radial right now, but I do believe femoral is very important. I think the studies that you know, Arnold and Mazen did many years ago to clarify the effect of ultrasound are important. I think it should be clear cut. You should always use ultrasound. I mean, going to be polite or not. I just moved to a lab a couple of years ago that used ultrasound for every case. It's dramatic. It's not just that you find the artery easier. You see if there's calcium in the artery. You see where the vein is. Sometimes the vein is on top of the artery. I mean, there's so many things you learn. And once you do it, actually, it's faster and safer. So as far as I'm concerned, you should always, always use ultrasound for any access, whether it's radial, femoral, IJ, that's the best way to be safe. And once you learn, it's actually faster too, so everyone wins. But I'll, I'll defer it. I know Arland is, you know, with Mazen, some of the experts on this. Yeah, I want to give credit to my friend and colleague Mazen for really pioneering this effort in ultrasound, but also first in a fluoroscopic access uh, in a thousand patient trial, that, which served as a model for our subsequent trial in ultrasound. Uh, I definitely agree that you know everyone else is using in the U.S. radiologists, vascular surgeons, they all know to use ultrasound because of the advantages. And uh, in fact, at the Viva conference, they have separate ultrasound classes uh, to to uh, access difficult arteries. Uh, I wanted to point out a, a couple of uh, you know newer things that might be up the, uh, down the pike um, with ultrasound. 
ultrasound, you can also, you know, when you have a sheath that's near the bifurcation by angiogram, sometimes you can't really define exactly where it inserts. And with ultrasound guidance, you can actually see where that wire inserts much more precisely. And you may be able to diagnose that it is indeed in the common femoral artery, and it might be safe to put in a closure device. Uh, I definitely agree that it's standard of care to, uh, to do a femoral angiogram, even though around the world it's not as common. We, work, we operate in the U.S. where the standard of care really is to do a femoral angiogram. And remember that the uh, number one cause of liability for uh, cath is still vascular access complications, in particular from the vascular access site from the femoral site. Yeah, I can say one thing. You know, I think in the previous session, Steve Bradley talked about innovation in healthcare delivery. These are not rocket science. I mean, this is proven by the studies that you did. It's all written. It's all out there. The problem is, who does it? Based on, you know, the survey that uh, Mauricio did, no one does. That's the problem. I mean, everyone knows what to do, but no one does it. And, and the problem is then you're going to get complications and not going good if you get sued. I mean, that's the wrong way to think about it. But if you think about it, if you get sued and you say, well, I did ultrasound, I did micropuncture, I did the x-ray, I mean, your argument is much, much stronger than if you did none of those because someone else will say, well, standard of care is ultrasound, standard of care is micropuncture, and you didn't do it. Why? I didn't mean to scare you. But. Great discussion. Uh, I, I know we can make this a uh, whole session, but we have to keep going to make sure we satisfy the radialists in the room. Uh, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Cohen, is going to present radial access, my best tips, tips and tricks. Thank you. Thank you, Mazen. So I'm going to try to summarize. Uh, I have lots of slides. I hope I can go through them uh, in, the, in the time that was allotted. So best radial. So, you know, general tips. Uh, get access fast, navigate the arm without disrupting any vessel, be gentle, never fight against the resistance with force. This is, uh, transradial access is just all about finesse. Understand, uh, you need to understand comp complex subclavian anatomies. Select the catheter that works for you. No man uh, fancy schmancy catheter, just use whatever works for you. If you like Jatkins, just use, J use Jatkins and, and, and be fast and be quick. And, and do a good diagnostic angiogram because a non-diagnostic angiogram is a, is a usual complication. Understand when it's time to cross over. Don't kill yourself trying to prove that you can do it. Um, if you find uh, um, and you, some, some anatomies, you should cross over and stop trying because you are not doing anything for the patient by demonstrating you can cross a loop. Uh, preserve the radial artery using patent hemostasis and full anticoagulation and ulnar ultra, ultra counter compression and vasodilators uh, at the end of the case. Um, Manos is going to talk about uh, radiation tips. Um, always do the catheter exchanges over 260 centimeter wires. Keep the guide wire within the catheter to avoid kinking because I've seen horrible kinking uh, of guiding catheters and then you need to go and then snare the tip and, and it becomes a nightmare. And then uh, always use lift, left ERA for patients with lima grafts. Don't try to go from one side to the other because you're going to be scratching the, the, the ascending aorta and you're going to send stuff up in the brain. And it's happened to me. It's not that, it, you know, it never happened. So <clears throat> again, uh, this is a, a slide from Arnold that I borrowed. Uh, always use ultrasound if you can't feel the pulse. I'm not sure that it's really mandatory to do that. I mean, we can debate about the, the use of ultrasound, but I think it's very useful. And if your lab has an ultrasound, why not use it? If you can, if you can see the, the, the access. Uh, in terms of how to navigate the arm, and a, a nice uh, tip is uh, about the wire. So you want to use the baby J wire that has a 1.5 millimeter ra radius at the tip. So it's uh, ideal for TR. You don't need actually, you don't need fluoroscopy to, uh, to go up and you may, need, you may decrease radiation. And then if you feel resistance, the slightest resistance, you always stop and see what's going on. The wire shaft, you can use stiff shafts just to straighten the subclavian anatomy. And then hydrophilic coating is very nice because it's more gentle on tortuous vessels. So this is the, the wire you should be using, 1.5 millimeter radius and 260 centimeters. Some people like to use the shorter and do the jet exchanges. It doesn't work for me, but you know it may work for you. Uh, the, this is a baby J wire. Soon after going in, it takes, uh, it takes the, the shape, and you can see it's not going into any side branch, it's just going straight. And then when you get up uh, in the arch, you have the patient take a deep breath, you direct the wire with the catheter, and then you are in the ascending aorta. So let's illustrate with a quick presentation, 79-year-old lady that comes with a STEMI, we activate the cath lab, and um, we maximize the use of transradials by trying to do all primary PCIs via transradial access because that's where the outcomes are best. So here we're stuck where we don't know what's, you know, first obstacle. 
the wire is not going. So if the wire is not going, the first step, stop and do a limited angiogram to identify the problem. So here we identify the problem and there's an anomalous radial coming off the brachial at the level of the arm. So you need to take a, you need to take a breath and then decide, can I negotiate this or I cannot negotiate this because I'm against uh, time, time is muscle. So I decided that I was going to negotiate that. So I went with the hydrophilic wire. The hydrophilic wire doesn't go beyond that point and there might be a little bit of a dissection. So can I do this or, I, or should I switch to the other arm or the groin? So I said, well, I think I can do it. So I went with a small wire and a, uh, a small angioplasty wire and, I, and then I got through. Then I advance the catheter and then the catheter gets stuck. So I take another limited angiogram. And can I do this or I cannot? So then if you see this image, please don't panic. Don't panic, don't pull everything out. Just uh, now you're a little bit committed, right? Just, that just hurts uh, watching that. But the patient was not hurting. So you need to understand that radial anomalies exist and this is a loop that you don't want to navigate. If you navigate this loop, you, you know, you're gonna spend so much time just cross over to the other side. Then this is a, the most common anomaly, the, the, the radial coming off the upper side of the brachial artery. So you need to be careful because you don't wanna dissect at that level. And then in renal patients, you need to understand that you're gonna be dealing with calcified vessels and smaller radials. Uh, sometimes tortuosity can be easily negotiated, like in this case, just with a wire. The wire straightens and then you finish your case. I'm sorry, let's go, let's go back. Um, and then at the end, you do a pullback angiogram and then everything looks uh, the same as when you started. Um, then sometimes it's not that easy and the wire will not go. So then if the wire doesn't go, don't push because you're gonna, you're gonna break something, you're gonna disrupt something. So took an angiogram. So there are solutions. So the solution is BAT, balloon assisted tracking. So this is a nice technique that was, uh, that was published by um, Dr. Um, Pancholi uh, along with um, another group. So this will smooth the transition between the wire and the catheter and this is what we did here. We still have the loop, so when, when, you, when you get to that point, all you wanna do is just torque one way or the other, and that will straighten the vessel, and then you can continue doing uh, your angiogram and finish. Uh, a different situation, the, the catheter gets stuck, like in our case that I was showing, and uh, you see horrible extravasation that hurts, right? Never panic in this situation, there's a solution for this, and the solution is to use the mother and, uh, the mother and child uh, technique or the combo technique, like Tejas Patel show, show, shows it, so you have an O35 wire across, don't wanna pull the wire, you wanna do, you wanna tampon at the vessel from the inside, right? So what you need is you, you come up with a, with a transition, uh, with a transition to the wire between the, between the leading edge of the guiding catheter and the wire by telescoping a long uh, 125 centimeter uh, multipurpose catheter, or whatever catheter you have, or you can use one of those, uh, one of those uh, dilators uh, for the shuttle sheet. So you, this is what you do, you advance, that goes, that creates a transition, you need to go, and then the whole assembly moves forward, and then at the end of the case, you do the pullback angiogram, and the pullback angiogram shows that uh, you have uh, successfully tamponaded the, <coughs> the, 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 the extravasation or the perforation. So back to the case, troubleshooting. So in this case, we decided to do balloon-assisted tracking, and uh, you can see how nicely now the catheter goes without any problems. Now we're against time, right? Now we have horrible uh, <laughs> uh, tortuosity, <laughs> horrible tortuosity in the, in, in the subclavian. So can I do it? Or I, so I'm gonna try, I'm, uh, I'm already committed. I work so hard. So uh, I'm getting through, okay? So, and then I redirect the wire, um, have the patient take a deep breath, uh, and um, have the patient take a deep breath and then, uh, and then have the patient take, um, move the, turn the, the, the head to the left. Look at that. So then you have to, you have to <laughs> torque the catheter so you direct it and that's a very tortuous, uh, that's a very tortuous order. Perhaps in a little old lady you may wanna go left. That's <laughs> another thing. <laughs> So that's, when you that's another thing, go left in little old ladies. So then the catheter is going down to the descending. So what you need to do is again, have a patient take a deep breath and then redirect. And here for support, I put an O35 wire. That's another tip. You can put an, an O35 wire along with the O15, the, the, the O14 wire 
just to, um, to, to, to support your manipulations a little bit better. Then we engage the coronary, uh, and um, here is how the, how the deep inspiration uh, straightens everything up. And then we balloon that, and then we have a happy, a happy finish. Uh, we do the pullback angiogram, and the door to balloon time was 50 minutes, and this patient can just sit up, and the hemostasis is achieved. So multivessel PCI with one guiding catheter, that's another thing you can do. So you, you use your EBU to angioplasty that uh, LAD. You have a nice result in the LAD. This is another primary, uh, primary PCI or subacute PCI that we took the patient straight from the, from, the, from the ER. And then what you need to do, you need to advance the back end of the, of the, J, of the J wire. That will straighten the ABU and transform the ABU into a, into a multipurpose. So you manipulate, uh, you rotate the multipurpose uh, clockwise into the other side, and then slowly advance into the right coronary cusp until you find the right coronary, as in this case, and then you slowly pull the wire, let the catheter take its shape, and then you're in. Once you're in, you have wonderful support. We found a lesion there in the right coronary. Um, we balloon and angioplasty that, and we gave ourselves a pat in the back because we finished uh, multivessel revascularization. Uh, one more tip about uh, Rima angiography. So don't do don't do the lima from the right side. I'd rather go and do a stick in the left arm rather than, do, uh, than, than try to cross over, especially in a thermatose aorta. So the, the lima catheter sometimes won't, won't just take the turn. So there's another catheter called the VB1 that is a half, it's like a half pigtail that takes a shape and will allow you to cannulate selectively uh, a rima. There is a VB1, and this is what's happening. So the, the IMA catheter is too straight to go into uh, a, a rima that usually comes off uh, the vertical part of the, of the right subclavian, so you need something that is, I mean, you can cut the pigtail, but you have the side, you, you have the side holes, so you get half of the injection outside in the subclavian. So VB1 is a good catheter to have in the, in the lab. So radial first, safety is always first. We go radial because it's safer, not because it's more dangerous. So the, there are a few limitations for radial angiography and intervention. The exchange of tricks and tips at these meetings is very important and useful to increase TRA use. I, I guess you are already using it. And sometimes and, and new technologies will further facilitate the expansion to all territories. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. We have a couple of minutes. I, I just want to say, I mean, for those of you who don't do radial, don't be discouraged. This is the exceptions, not the rule. But it's important to know how to navigate all these very well presented, all the tips and tricks. Um, and, you know, if you want to start radial, definitely don't start with, with an SC elevation of my patient on the table. But um, any other comments from the panel? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was really impressive that you did that all, all in a STEMI, a torturous patient. So I think everybody has their, their threshold, right? When are you going to give in? And the, the, the Sky radial guidelines say for a, STEMI, for a STEMI patient, you know, give it three minutes to get access. And if, you get, if it takes you long to do that, then you should probably move on to femoral or move on to another access site. Uh, but in terms of tortuosity, you know, I think, I think we've all dealt with these patients who are generally older, uh, have one area of tortuosity, and then they have another area of tortuosity. And then, you're, like you say, you're committed. And uh, your, your threshold, uh, of your, your tolerance of time depends on so many things, how rushed you are, your, your, your cath lab's tolerance, your staff's tolerance, and I think uh, I commend you for getting that through. Um, are you concerned about injuring the, the, the radial artery as you push the balloon with the balloon-assisted tracking technique? Well, um, because for, you, for sure you, there's endothelial you, you injury. Made, yeah, for have, sure yeah. there's endothelial injury when you when you do that. But once you pass the, the radial, I think the, the I think that the the, the, the vessels are, are large enough that are not going to get injured as much. And then the balloon tracking uh, helps pressure, you yeah. um, navigate the tortuosity. Yeah. So no, no pressure. I think it pressure. works. It, it's a solution that works well. It's a nice uh, it's a nice uh, mm -hmm. trick to know. Do you, do you use, like, sometimes we, we follow in our cath lab, the patient's older than 75 or the height is less than 5 foot 5. Um, we, we go left instead of right directly from the beginning. I, I you, think it's a very that? good policy. Right. I think it's a very good policy. Uh, you, know, I, it, it, you know, you have to bend your back, and you need to, go, you need to have a good setup to do left, left radials. And another <laughs> tip is perhaps consider doing snap box access. That's become very trendy and sexy lately because it looks nice just to have access there. 
But, uh, or but I'll tell you another way to do reg regular access without snuff. Use a longer sheath and just tape it here, and then it yeah. looks like the snuff box, but it's not. <laughs> it, it serves the same purpose. <laughs> yes. All right, perfect. Thank you. That was, that was great. Uh, so we move, just to keep moving on time. Uh, next, we go about radiation safety, uh, best tips and tricks, and Manos is going to present this. Manos. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Mazen and Mauricio. This is a, a great session. Uh, great to see many people standing there. And before I start, I have one question for you. Do you love your family? <laughs> because if you do, you'll be watching very carefully to this. Because if you love your family, you're going to be around. And one of the potential ways not to be around is if you get a lot of radiation and get a complication from this. Now, this is a topic that I've been very passionate about for many, many years. And uh, you know, despite that, when I go see other labs that travel very often, I get amazed at how relaxed people are about radiation. Mm -hmm. There's many syndromes I'll describe that I think uh, we need to be over. But this is not rocket science. It's like access. We know exactly what we need to do right now. There are many good ways to reduce your radiation dose. The problem is implementation. No one does it. So no need to tell you that radiation is bad. There is this paper showing that people who have exposed radiation were much more likely to have left radial tumors. Is it confirming? No. Is it a randomized style? It's not, but it's something to get your attention. And we do know, this is from Progress CTO, there is tremendous variation. These are all experienced operators doing CTOs. We can see the tremendous variation in how much radiation is being used for the patient. You care for the patient, but also how much the patient gets is directly related to how much you get. That's why minimizing the dose of the patient is going to minimize your dose. So how are you going to reduce the radiation? This is not rocket science, four ways to do it. One is to reduce the intensity of the radiation beam. How do you do that? You do it by positioning the patient properly. If the II is flying up, this is not good. And you'll be amazed how many times the II is down. Now, you don't want to cause a black eye on the patient, but you can get very close. And personally, I want to have the intensifier, the image receptor, touching the patient lightly. You don't want to be doing 50 degree or 60 degree angulated shots because your radiation is going to be much more. You don't want to have your hands in the X-ray beam. That's even worse because being, you know, getting the beam from the um, scatter is one thing, but putting your hands in there, getting a huge dose in your hand, you don't want to do that. This tells you that staying in the middle, having less angles, you're going to get much less radiation if you go to this more angulated views, which sometimes you have to. But for most cases, you don't have to. Minimizing those is going to cut your dose and the patient's dose. <clears throat> There's a button you should know and use it routinely several times in a case, and that's the fluorostore button. This means you do manipulation. You do a wire manipulation to save it, fluorostore button. The, you put a stent in, a balloon in, don't see it. Press the fluorostore button, a tenth of the radiation, one second is all you need. Collimation, that's something also not done very commonly. You don't need to see everything. You need to see some things. The one downside here is if you do it, if your wire tip is outside the field of view, make sure you pan from time to time, make sure it doesn't go out and cause a perforation. Low magnification, we're doing this more and more. If you have these big giant screens, you don't need to go to uh, zoom in because the electronics do the zoom in for you. And that's actually easier because then you have the whole heart in your field. For example, in CTO, you can have the donor vessel, the CTO, all in the same picture without having to pan. Buy a better X-ray machine. If you have a million or two staying around, it does make a huge difference, actually. The newer machines, Zim and Philips, they have much, much less radiation dose than the older machines. There are new solutions coming out, solutions that actually focus in the part of the screen you are looking at, so the radiation is more there and less on the other part. There's another solution that has a glass tracking on you. You look at the screen, and the radiation focuses having a clear picture only in that part and not in the other part. I wish we did this for our fellows, because when you look there, outside the screen, there's no need to press the fluoro button, but that's a different story. <laughs> so time. Time is key. The less you fluoro or seen, the less you're going to have it. There is a syndrome is well described and is highly prevalent in interventional labs. It's called the heavy foot syndrome, which is you press the pedal and you keep your foot on the pedal. You'll be amazed. I'm amazed. I'm guilty of this. I harass my fellows a lot. But I do believe that irradiation should be as little as possible. One frame is all you need for your balloon. One. The fluorostorm function is for the same reason we discussed before, and the collimation, of course. You don't need to do fluoroscopy at 15 strain per second. Seven and a half is plenty. 
I actually get upset if I see a very clear picture because that means I'm using high frame, I'm wasting radiation. For the very, very vast majority, with exception of maybe stingray reentry or some other complex manipulation, six frames or seven and a half frames per second is all you need. Cuts your fluoro dose in the, immediately by half. Um, and that's, again, something you can do very easily in most labs right now um, and cut your radiation significantly. Distance. This is a basic law. Radiation is more intense the closer you get to the beam. So what do you do? You step back. How can you do that? Very simple. You move back. Just make a step back. <laughs> I mean, it's not rocket, rocket science. Again, it's implementation. This is not, we know what it is. This is known for many, many years. It's 1900. The further away you are, the better it is. Now you're going to say, well, but the manifold is there. Well, there's a 30 cents piece of equipment called a manifold extension that you can put on your manifold and your tech can go back three feet and you, you just reduce the radiation by a significant factor. Again, not rocket science, simple things, use an extension, everyone moves back and that's all you can do. Again, don't put your hands in the beam. I've published my, my partners, my former partner's hands several times as an example of not to do. If you really want to obtain access under fluoro, get this system, it's called quick access, you can put it under fluoro, and then you get your access, then put the wire down, remove the system, and your hands are not flu uh, fluoroscopy. Now, I li like to joke that he has a big golden ring that seals him, so for those of you, either get a huge golden ring or don't put your hands under the X-ray beam. And the last thing is the shielding. It's fascinating that many people don't actually realize where the radiation is coming to us. The radiation coming to the operator is not from the primary beam. The primary beam is coming from the bottom of the table, hits the patient, and then comes to you. It's the scatter. And the scatter is highest at the junction of the X-ray beam, hitting the patient back. So your shield, if your shield is up here, you're doing not much. Your shield needs to be down here, right where the scatter is happening. Now, of course, the shield in many labs can be in a different part of the room than the operator. That's even worse. But even if you do that, what you want is bring the shield obviously close to the patient, but down. That's where the scatter is happening. That's where you want the radiation screen to be at. The other things you can do is you can use uh, disposable radiation uh, protection devices. So this is the rat pad. There are other versions of this. And that cuts back the radiation coming back to you. Uh, there are scene guards. There's actually a paper uh, recently in circulation documenting what we know. The highest dose is actually not to your head. The higher dose is to your legs. They did endovascular procedures without wearing scene guards. And actually, your legs, they do have bone marrow. And that's actually what you may have an adverse event. And they looked at genetic uh, um, uh, markers of radiation damage. And you did have significant damage. Then they were wearing those scene guards. And they were having much less of that. I'm not doing this yet. But I'm actually, I, I, I have ordered scene guards. And I think that's something to consider. A little painful. You look funny. But you know what? Just remember, do you love your family? <laughs> now, if you want to go more um, drastic, there's a system called zero gravity. It's ceiling suspended. And then um, that uh, literally uh, claps. And you don't have to wear the lead. and provides you excellent radiation protection. Um, Tony Speedy in Missouri uses it and swears by it. His back pain is gone. He can do cases all day. Something to consider. And of course, there's robotic PCI in which you are sitting very comfortably uh, in the cockpit and doing the cases. Maybe a little less for uh, uh, complex cases, but definitely something rapidly developing. A little more expensive, but another solution to this. So how can you reduce radiation dose? Um, there's these fa factors in density time distal, but essentially go as far as you can, use as less as you can, and use seals. Can you see radiation? You cannot, but there are some devices like um, um, this one, the blipper, that can give you an auditory signal. There is the dose aware that gives you a red light if you're getting a lot of radiation, so you can adjust your dose. And we also know that being in courses like this and just be hearing these things and having and someone harass you about it can have significant impact. That was a single course in Germany, reduced um, X-ray by about 20% or not. The other thing is, how many of you know how much radiation you got last year? One, two. Yeah, I know. So this is my number, 1,500 millirem. You need to know this, because if you're at 3,000, that's a problem. If you're low, it's great, but if you're not, you need to know about this. And it's amazing how relaxed we're about it. I mean, we do physical checkups. Well, this is a critical thing for us working in the X-ray environment. No one knows about it. So you should know about it, and what you should do, put in your lab and put the wall of shame post everyone's numbers, make a competition. The worst ones buys food for the lab. So to summarize, radiation we know is bad. And the problem with this is whether you're going to get a side effect or not, you won't know for 20, 30, 40 years. 
but nothing good can come out of it. So the less you use, the better it's going to be. There are many things you can do about it, so start doing them today. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is very, very good, very helpful. Can you comment, just because I saw it on your slides, but you did not uh, touch on it, on the picture where you had the floral save button, you also had floral favor one selected. And I, I saw that. Can you make just a small comment on that, if you don't mind, for um, the audience? That, that's actually an excellent point. I didn't talk about this all I should. So your X-ray machine, the same X-ray machine is not the same in any lab in the United States. The reason is there are many filters, algorithms, things that are fine tuning in the machine. And actually, one of the best things that happened to us, we, had, we have Siemens machines in my lab. We had someone come and spend a week with us and optimize the labs. So he did different versions, showed us the X-ray image with different kind of flavors of fluoroscopy. And then we finally chose the ones that were the least radiation. I can tell you this alone, the fine tuning of the, uh, of the machine and choosing the settings of the filters, everything else, that's tremendous. And now there is like high fluoro dose and low fluoro dose, as you said. And I mean, we're using low, for, actually, I was telling them to take out any height, have only the low, but some people were a little protesting. But the reality of it is, you want to use low for the very vast majority of cases, and actually, it's ultra low we use for CT or PCI. Something you don't realize, but it's not the same machine you are using. If it's the same machine, it's not the same, depending on how it's optimized. Thank you. Perfect. How do you do with uh, large patients that uh, chew radiation? I mean, and you just see the rat. I mean, the, you see the radiation dose just going. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, you're just turning your attention to the radiation dose rather than what you're doing. So I think coronary bypass graft is excellent for these patients. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding, actually. The problem is the surgeons don't think, don't, don't think that, so they come back to you. Many tables don't go more than 475. The highest one we have is like 520 pounds, 515 pounds. So sometimes you cannot even get them on the table. If you get them, Actually, we did a study in Dallas where we actually did prophylactic, uh, uh, um, we did assessment in people before bariatric surgery. We got a lot of experience in this. The key things are the same. No angulation. Essentially, it's AP for everything. If you go a little angulation, you lose it, especially caudal, it's over. So AP, this is the ones you might have to use more um, the high fluoroscopy setting. And then you decide if you're going to do this retrograde complexity on these people. And sometimes you may say, well, I'll try for three or four gray and then I'm going to stop. And the other component I didn't necessarily mention I should have is that you don't wait until the text tells you to fill out the form that you've exceeded the five gray radiation limit. The same way you look at the x-ray, you should look constantly at how much uh, x-ray you've used. When you see the grays start racking up, you're a one, two, three, four gray, you start seriously stop about th uh, think about stopping because you're going to get to those numbers. As you know, 15 gray is a sentinel event, you go to the JCO, but most hospitals over five, it's a major paperwork, and you have to inform the patients, a lot of things to do about it. Uh, just a show of hands from the audience, uh, how many of you in your cath lab have somebody, one of the techs or one of the nurses or whoever, actually responsible for badges, make sure badges actually get, you know, yeah. This is very important. I find out, like, if, if we don't have somebody actually to take this, the, take care of the badges. Some people don't even change their badges, don't put them on and stuff like that. The other thing we had our text do, the recorders, is every gray, mention it like speak on the speaker, you're one gray, you're two gray, you're three gray, you're four gray, especially for long cases. So that's something somebody can consider. Anybody else, Arnold, any comments? No, all right, well, thank you, Manas. Great, Great thank presentation, you. thank you. So um, our next speaker is also a very good friend, Arnold Cito. Um, so he's going to talk about uh, imaging, my best tips and tricks. All right, good afternoon, um, almost, almost afternoon. I, I revised these slides because I thought that the uh, major confusion seems to be on the physiology side. So I thought that uh, I'd emphasize more the uh, physiology and less the imaging. Uh, but let's start with the imaging. You know, the quick key about imaging is that we should probably use it more. Uh, we had a talk earlier this week that said that, you know, only about 10 to 15% of our PCIs have uh, intravascular imaging, IVUS done afterwards. And at least the data, even in the drug-eluting stent era, suggests that uh, there's at least some benefit in terms of reducing MACE by up to 
25% death MI tar target lesion revascularization. And this is from all the studies, uh, 14 observational and three randomized trials. The, the latest randomized trial, the IVIS XPL, was just three years ago, and it showed a 50% reduction in MACE driven by a reduction in target lesion revascularization. And so the goal here is, you know, optimize the stent opt, uh, uh, implantation, make sure that it's fully expanded. And uh, some people, myself included, you know, we don't use, I don't use it more than 20% of the time, but uh, I think that, you know, really the, the message is we should post-dilate routinely, we should post-dilate with the largest vessel uh, balloon possible, and uh, if, if you're not going to do that, if you're concerned, then you should at least image it. So uh, another imaging tip I have is that I've had experience, uh, unfortunate experience, of where the, my phased array catheter, the vol volcano eagle eye, just won't cross the torturous or calcified lesion. And uh, you know, my, I was fortunate to also have a rotational catheter, the volcano uh, revo catheter, uh, or if the equivalent is the Boston Atlantis SR Pro. They both have the same crossing profile, 3.5 French, but the phased array catheter has six uh, ultrasound, pro, uh, ultrasound sensors at the tip. That makes it much more rigid at the tip and much, more uh, much less flexible when going through tortuosity. So uh, my tip is to use rotational catheters to cross any kind of tortuosity or calcium or difficult lesion. And uh, this is shown in Boston Scientific's uh, uh, business uh, slides, which suggests that the Revo catheter has a much uh, easier crossing force compared to the Eagle Eye, and that their OptiCross 5 French compatible catheter uh, is also much more easier to cross than, in, than a phased array catheter. That being said, the phased array catheter is very quick and easy, and it's still the number one catheter used in America. If you're using OCT, OCT has the exact same crossing profile as the OptiCross, so you can be assured that if you're going to cross with OCT, uh, that's going to be just as good as using a rotational IVIS catheter. So when do you use which IVIS catheter So for rotational? Anytime I see torturosity or bifurcation, going through a stent strut, calcification, or a small caliber vessel, I'm using rotational. The phased array catheter is good for lar larger straight vessels. Uh, a CTO, when you need a short tip, when, because there's a small separation and distance between the tip and the uh, in in imaging element for the rotational. If you have a short distal target, uh, for example, if it's a very distal LED, um, or whenever you're in a rush, which is, of course, all the time. But in general, the most common I IVIS applications would benefit from a rotational catheter. So I think this is a revelation that I learned only a few years later into practice. Um, it also tends to give better image quality. I mean, these are the same 40 megahertz catheters, supposedly, 40 megahertz frame uh, uh, resolution, and yet the phased array catheter on the left uh, looks much worse than the 40 megahertz frame uh, megahertz uh, resolution on the, uh, the center one. And so each one has different, uh, different artifacts, as we well know, but um, you know, it, it, definitely I think the rotational catheters give better image quality. And the most recent thing is the HD IVIS, the 60 megahertz catheters from Assist and Boston Scientific, which of course will only make it better and, and come closer closer and closer to, the, uh, to OCT. Uh, how about stent sizing? We don't often get, you know, I, I never got formal training in IVIS, but, uh, you know, this latest article from the European Heart Journal just a couple months ago really goes over all the studies of um, stent sizing and comes to a consensus on how to use IVIS or OCT uh, to determine what your optimal stent length is and also your stent sizing. And we, get, we all get confused by the different criteria used, but the conclusion of this uh, consensus group was that you should use the distal reference lumen and that you should use, you can upsize it from the distal reference lumen lumen by uh, 0 to 0.25 millimeters, or if you're using the EEM, use uh, downsize it by uh, 0 0.25. So I thought this was very useful, and I definitely reference, refer you to that article. That article also talks about the various combination, various uh, advantages and disadvantages of IVIS versus OCT. The short answer is that OCT, of course, causes you to use about 30 cc's more of contrast, according to Illumion 3, but it gives you higher quality, uh, higher quality pictures. I use OCT uh, whenever I know I'm going to take a picture anyway with angiogram. I'm also going to run an OCT to minimize the use of repeated measurements. So uh, those are the various things. But getting on to physiology, uh, I want to start from the basics. Where do we measure the FFR? And this is something that's uh, somewhat confusing to people. Uh, when you run IV adenosine, you often see this type of pattern. When you measure at point A, the FFR measures as 0.68. When you measure at point B, where the PD is lowest, it's 0.76. And when you get to a so-called stable hyperemic phase, it's 0.85. So which of you guys, which, which should we measure? Well, it turns out that this has been something in, in debate for the past five years. The machines, they all take the lowest value, the 0.68. That's what, that's what they can determine. They can't really tell when is there a stable hyperemic value. But for tw 20 years, we've been saying, wait for the stable hyperemic value, because Nico Pyle's definition of FFR said that coronary resistances could only be assumed to be uh, constant and minimal with maximal hyperemia, and had to be stable. 
And then the, the most recent guidelines from 2012 um, said to take the PDPA ratio at the lowest PD, the nadir of PD, which would be 0.76 in this case. So which one to choose? Well, uh, only recently in the past few years have we figured out that it's probably the nadir. Uh, there's a difference, of course, between the lowest FFR and the stable hyperemic FFR. This study, these two studies suggested that that average difference is actually 0.04, which obviously makes a difference when you're near the cut point. And then, un annoyingly, if you keep on running the IV adenosine, you actually don't get stable hyperemia about 40% of the time. You actually get cyclical hyperemia. If you keep on running past two minutes, you'll find that it wears off. Despite continued IV adenosine, now you get uh, the FFR going back to normal, uh, 0.96 in this case, and, uh, and you're actually, your, flow, uh, your flow rates using this flow wire showed no effect of the hyperemia after, uh, after about two minutes. So it comes and goes, and this is just the physiology where the, uh, where the, where the, the body's probably trying to compensate for the hyperemic effect. And uh, this was actually verified from, um, by Johnson et al. Uh, in the Verify study, where they actually showed that about 40% of the time you didn't get a stable hyperemia, and only 57% 50, you did. But when you repeated them on two paired examples, the, the two paired tracings wouldn't have the same pattern 31% of the time. So this whole concept of us using IV adenosine, the advantage of having a stable hyperemia, is actually a bit of a falsehood. Um, and because you know 41 uh, you know 41 percent of the time it wouldn't be uh, consistent. However, then the lowest FFR they found was had a very high reproducibility and correlation with core lab analysis. So this, this paper, which included Nico Piles and uh, Dil Fearon, uh, basically confirmed that within reason, always take the minimum FFR value. Don't wait for sp stable hyperemia. Take whatever the machine tells you. Uh, and so you should take what, in this case, is a 0.68 value. Take the maximal separation between the two things. In this case, the answer would be A. Other things you can do, uh, you should change, all the machines currently default to a single beat measurement of FFR. This can lead to a lot of variability when you have AFib, respiratory variations, and that can make a big difference in your care. Uh, so if you're gonna, you know, most studies of FFR clinically have used a three to five beat average FFR, which reduce, reduces the effect of single beat variation. Another tip I recommend, you know, now that IV adenosine is somewhat debunked uh, as having stable hyperemia, then maybe we should be using IC adenosine. It's much faster. You don't have to wait two minutes for it to, for it to take effect. You can do much more repeated measurements of multiple vessels or serial lesions, and the dose lasts for 10, 12 to 20 seconds, exactly when you expect the maximal hyperemia to, to take effect. It's, so I've, I've actually done, uh, you know, three-vessel IFR and FFR in patients in as little as five minutes. Uh, you also tend to have fewer symptoms. My VA patients all have COPD, so I found that IC adenosine tends to cause less bronchospasm or flushing symptoms. The concern here of using IC adenosine, of course, is that your guide has to be engaged. So you, if you, you, must, you must remember to disengage the guide when finally measuring. So moving on to the more controversial things coming up, the when to use adenosine-free indices. You've heard a lot about IFR from the defined flare flare trial and sweetheart, and uh, basically I, I use adenosine-free indices and we favor them when there's contraindications to adenosine, bradycardia, COPD, diparamidol, uh, or when you're suspecting of a poor response to adenosine, like end-stage renal disease, caffeine use, uh, when you need to measure multiple lesions for speed, or when you want to measure a pullback. And uh, the reason that IFR or PDPA would, might be superior to FFR in a pullback scenario is that this annoying situation of so-called um, crosstalk, when you have two lesions on FFR, when you fix one lesion, it turns out that it increases the flow during hyperemia uh, to, uh, to exaggerate the effect of the first lesion. So what you thought was a 0.85 on the first lesion, uh, after fixing the second lesion, turns into a 0.75. This is very annoying because all of a sudden you've had, you, you, you missed a lesion. It might be a left main even. With uh, more, with resting hy hyperemia, with rest, sorry, with resting rate flow, it tends to be much more stable. So you fix one lesion, it tends to stay, that middle value tends to stay, and much, it's much more predictable. And that was, predi that was actually uh, demonstrated on the IFR gradient study, uh, shown just recently in April, uh, which showed that the mean IFR between predicted IFR versus outcome IFR after PCI was actually uh, only a 1.4% 1 .4 error, and that you can reliably predict the IFR after fixing a lesion. So, well, you know, when, when do you do IFR, PD, uh, DPR? When you know, there's multi -lesions, multiple lesions or pullback, or if you're short on time, consider the resting indices. If these resting indices are borderline, use FFR. If you want a complete evaluation, do everything like I do because the IC adenosine takes so, such little time. If you want to stent any particular lesion or defer, pick the data that you want. If you have a discordance, pick the data that you, you favor because uh, they're both imperfect. None, nothing's going to work all the time. Whatever you do, use physiology and attention to technical details.
So in my final minutes, I'm going to say, show you a few case examples of discordance. The, uh, this is a saphenous vein graph at the focal lesion. It showed that the resting PDPA was 0.98. You saw a very focal ring-like lesion that looked like a valve. The contrast FFR was also non-diagnostic at 0.89. But when you started giving adenosine FFR, the FFR dropped down dramatically to 0.69. So a, mi a big discordance between an, FFR, a, an IFR resting ratio, which is very normal, and an FFR, which was very abnormal. And when you go in with IVIS, there's about an 87% focal lesion. And so who's going to fix this? Are you going to listen to the IFR or are you going to listen to the FFR? Well, the answer is uh, you should probably listen to the FFR in this instance. We fixed it. And after the procedure, the FFR was normalized to 0.91. We think we did a good thing. The data is still up, out, in the, uh, out there. But, uh, but I think clinically speaking, you, you do what you, what, what you think is in your best judgment for the patient. Here's a contra example. This patient had a distal posterior lateral branch. He had dialysis, so I already suspect that his uh, adenosine response will be pretty poor. I get the wire out there. The IFR is very bad at 0.81 from a resting ratio of 0.86. The IFR pullback suggests that, that the, there's a relatively big step up at that lesion. But then the FFR for, went from a resting ratio of about 0.86 to a very minimal response to adenosine of 0.82. And I know this from experience that dialysis patients all, microvascular, have all this microvascular disease. They have a terrible hyperemic response in terms of adenosine. So am I going to believe the FFR or the IFR here? Well, I'm going to believe the IFR. Um, and it's a very focal lesion. So even though I can't pass a stent because it's calcified, just with balloon angioplasty alone, I'm able to get this PDPA to 0.95 up from 0.86. And I'm convinced I did him a, a favor. Last case here, uh, check the post-PCI FFR. Here's a very torturous LAD. Uh, the ramus artery is uh, FFR'd and is found to be negative. We did adenosine hyperemia with 120 micrograms of IC adenosine. It's clearly positive at 0 .8, uh, 0 0.67. We put in the stent. The stent looks pretty good. Are we done? Uh, most of us would say yes. It's not the standard of care to do a post-PCI FFR. We have to study it. We're doing the I defined PCI study right now. Uh, but there's a lot of data from the uh, University of Arkansas and Arkansas VA which showed that uh, after PCI, the 21% of patients still had an FFR that was ischemic and that you led to an, a subsequent intervention with post dilatation or additional stenting. And then you, when your post-PCI FFR was low, less than 0.86, you had a worsened MACE rate. So what do we do? We happened to have an assist catheter allowed us to put, in a, put it in the catheter and measure the FFR again. It was clearly abnormal still after that stent. And what happened is that we uh, found on IVIS a very tight osteal LED that we couldn't see on angiography. And uh, this was obviously very concerning to us that we needed to fix this. Otherwise, we'd have stent thrombosis or some other event. So we sent the osteum carefully. And then one more IVIS and FFR. And we find that the FFR is 0.91. The osteum has been stented. And uh, now we're good to go. So my summary, imaging tips, use imaging more, use rotational catheters more, use it to measure stents, sizing, physiology, the best FFR is the lowest FFR, that use IC adenosine where you can, use IFR pullback, and measure at PCI, uh, post-PCI FFR. Thank you. Arnold, thank you for this uh, good presentation. So you, you are doing IFR, FFR, and contrast FFR on all your patients? Yeah, I was doing contrast FFR. Um, that, that's really, uh, it's more of an estimate because it depends on uh, their effect on contrast. We know that contrast causes 60 to 80% of the hyperemia of adenosine. Um, but, you know, right now I'm just doing IFR and So, and, so uh, yesterday adenosine. we were in another great session and showed some data that actually contrast FFR uh, the area under the curve to see sensitivity specificity is actually better than IFR. So one would argue you should actually do more contrast FFR and believe these data rather than IFR. What's your thought so on that? So the contrast study was, uh, you know, written by folks that, uh, who were more FFR advocates and against IFR. Remember that study is a, showed contrast hyperemia was, of course, closer to adenosine hyperemia. So that area the, under the curve was against an FFR standard. Well, the IFR folks would say that, hey, we have outcome data now independent of the hyperemic standard. We shouldn't be compared that way. So. Um, Essentially, if the, the, the whole model is no longer that IFR is an estimate of FFR. It's like IFR is in a whole different world of resting ratios. And resting hemodynamics uh, has the same clinical outcomes, according to Define Flair and IFR Sweetheart. So uh, that's what the arguments would be from both camps. And uh, you're going to continue to hear those arguments. As, as Just out of curiosity of the audience, how many use uh, FFR, regular adenosine FFR? OK, ma maybe majority. And IFR? And both? Oh, there are some. Oh, okay, good. Um, and IV versus IC adenosine, just out of curiosity. IV adenosine and IC adenosine. All right. 
Well, thank Wait, you. So, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm still very confused because in our lab, it's very easy for the nurses to prepare I, uh, IV adenosine, and that's the way we try to do it because it gives us more stable, more stable values. But now you're telling me that the stable values are not where we should go. We should go with the lowest PDPA. Right, so yes, exactly. You should be going for the lowest PDPA, and that's why we wanted to show this again. Uh, but um, you know, the stable hyperemia is good, it's good for 30 seconds, just like uh, IC adenosine is good for 30 seconds, roughly. But in 40% of cases, you'll start having this cyclical hyperemia. So if you take your time pulling back across a multi-lesion LAD, you're, gonna, you're not going to have a reliable uh, hyperemia during that phase. Also, if you think that the worst, the, the biggest separation of PDPA is going to be initially on induction of hyperemia, then with stable hyperemia, you're already a 0.04 above on average. So you may not be getting that maximal hyperemia yeah. anymore. And so even Bill Farron, after seeing some of our data, suggested that, well, you know what, maybe I'm going to go to IC adenosine too. So to have him go that far, it's, just, it's not saying something. Yeah, and uh, any comment about, um, about the sensor, the electrical versus... Uh versus uh, the yeah. fiber optic? Yeah, the, the, the piezoelectric crystal uh, sensors from St. Jude and Volcano, the traditional wire makes it a very poorly performing wire. The newer wires uh, from Comet uh, uh, or OpSense uh, you know, are fiber optic and they tend to be less, more resistant to drift. The fiber optic catheter from Assist is also very good too. So uh, everybody's, uh, you know, the fiber optic seems to be superior and more resistant to drift. And drift is, a, a, you know, is actually the worst problem. More, more important than IC or anything else, IV adenosine, it's about drift because that affects 17% of cases. And so you, have, you should always check your uh, pullback uh, FFR to make sure it's equalized. I can say actually this is a rare example. Usually when we do more things, uh, innovation means you do more things, more complicated, DK crash, all these things. Now here's the opposite. You're telling us resting is great. You don't have to give adenosine. Even if you do, I, I see it's great. So it just made our life easier, less cost, and, and faster. The one question I had is so IFR or PDPA or DPR for after you put a stand, so you do that or you should do FFR? What are your thoughts? It doesn't matter. Either is fine. Um, so that's being compared. The FFR gradient study is going to be published next year, probably, a uh, thousand patients from Europe, where they're checking routine post-PCI FFR. And then we're part of the defined PCI trial, which is testing post-PCI IFR. Um, I would say that both of them, just from clinical experience, shows us what we're missing, that we're going to miss those osteo-LEDs that we just don't image properly on, on angiogram. And I think that part of the reason why IVIS shows the benefit is because they're, it's showing us all that diffuse disease that we're not seeing by angiograms. And I suspect that if you did post-PCI, FFR, or IFR on all patients, you actually might uh, be able to you know, negate the benefit of, of IVIS, potentially, because you can demonstrate that, uh, you know, that, the, that you're get, getting most of the lesions. Now, that's speculative, you still haven't you know, determined if your stent is fully expanded, but uh, I think that, you know, I think definitely the uh, post-PCI IFR is just as or more important than the IVIS in my mind, but again, totally speculative. Uh, last, la just last uh, comment or question, now that I have Manus and Arnold in the panel. So when we do CTOs, and, or Manus does the CTOs, then you have uh, this uh, horrible uh, diesel target. Uh, the old CTO guys uh, give themselves a pat in the back, oh, this is gonna get better. Is there any physiology? Uh, about the, how to predict this is going to get better, the patient is going to get better, the patient is going to recover function. Any, any comment in that regard of that? Uh? Sure. I can tell you, my cases all do great. <laughs> so I can speak for that. But like like femoralies never have a problem. Exactly. <laughs> well, no, they rarely do. But no, I think it's a great point. Um, the challenge there is, uh, so there is, there is many studies showing how much the vessel grows. The average is 0.4 millimeters. So once you open a CTO, the distal vessel is grown to go by an average of 0.4, but the variation between zero and going up to one, one plus millimeter. You don't lose a front. The problem is if you're going to a very small territory, you're putting now stents in a 2.0 vessel, then your stenosis rate is going to be much higher. Plus you may uh, affect it by furcation, lose side branches. So that's why most of us try to not stand extensively. Is there validation? It's not validated quite well. What we do know is for the donor vessel, if you have an FFR that is low, it's going to get better if you open the CTO because you have to supply blood to less myocardium, but that's not a huge effect, it's like a 0 0.03, 0 0.04. Probably I'll look at comment on this. So, so if you have an FFR of, or IFR of 0.6 or 0.7, it's unlikely by fixing the CTO you have to impact the other vessel. Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd like to keep going just to make sure we have a few minutes for the audience to ask any questions at the end. So next we invite our colleague Giannis to present optimal bifurcation treatment. Thank you so much. So bifurcations is a, a very nice example on how precision medicine uh, 
can help us optimize the technique and essentially improve clinical outcomes. So bifurcations uh, account for 20%, uh, one-fifth of the coronary interventions, and we know well that they don't do uh, well from uh, the outcome standpoint. They exhibit high rates, uh, close to 10 to 20% of first stenosis, thrombosis, and recurrent events within a year, and essentially bifurcation PCI still remains a challenging issue, and the ideal treatment strategy is still uh, not known. So the question is, is there any ideal bifurcation standing strategy? The, the obvious answer is no, because bifurcations vary among individuals. Bifurcations are different even in the same coronary system, even within the same coronary artery. And we have multiple unknown issues in the bifurcation uh, uh, standing. We don't know uh, how we would dilate, what technique, one versus two stand technique is the optimal. When you go for two stands, what uh, technique is the best? Um, stand type length is an issue. How we post dilate a bifurcation PCI? We have different techniques, pot, kissing, combination of those. Uh, how we perform an optimal pot or kissing, and at the end of the day, how all those interventions affect the local biomechanics. So, lots of um, unknown. Uh, there's obviously uh, the situation that one size fits all. It's not the case here. We need to consider a patient-specific anatomical parameters, and we need to consider the local biomechanics to help optimize the bifurcation standing and obviously the outcomes. So, we need to have to implement an individual approach with uh, nice pre-procedure planning tailored to each specific bifurcation and computation simulations is a nice way to achieve those targets. We um, had the opportunity to put together all those thoughts together in, a, in the state of the art review uh, um, uh, published in JAC and uh, here we outline our thoughts on how bifurcation uh, simulation and modeling can help us optimize the techniques and outcomes. And the concept is summarized here. Uh, we have the bifurcation, which is standard according to the current state of the art. The idea is that we use this anatomy, we reconstruct it, we simulate the standing uh, in the computational environment using realistic approaches, and then identify which technique fits best for, for each specific uh, anatomical geometry and extent of disease. And then hopefully with this approach, we can have uh, better um, uh, stand design, uh, optimize our stand techniques, and finally improve our risk analysis and thrombosis outcomes. So fundamental question number one is uh, about how this specific bifurcation standing approach is accurate. We compared our uh, um, computational approaches with the in vitro standing, using the in vitro standing of the art. We, uh, corrected the, we, we created this uh, silicon-based uh, uh, bifurcation. We stated that in um, in vitro environment. That's the bifurcation standing uh, followed by pot proximally. We did micro CT and reconstructed the, uh, the stand. And then we used exactly the same geometry, using exactly the same stent design and inflation atmospheres, and we performed the same technique in the uh, computational environment. That's the stent deployment, and that's the uh, post dilatation with pot. And then we compared them head to head, one to one. This is the computational uh, stenting, and this is the in vitro stenting, and you can appreciate that quantitatively uh, the areas and the diameters across the entire stent area, either with the computational or the uh, in vitro approach were pretty comparable. And qualitatively, that's the in vitro approach. This is the computational approach. This is um, uh, proximal to the, um, the bifurcation, at the bifurcation side and distal to this, and you can see very similar stand position. Even the malaposition of the stand struts at uh, this side of the side branch uh, were reproduced with the computational approach. The second qu big question is how these patient-specific approaches uh, can be feasible in, uh, in, clinic in the clinical setting. We are conducting uh, the FLOSR study, which is a multi-center perspective open-label study, which uh, um, um, uh, uh, compares um, uh, two different standing techniques in terms of like the effect of local biomechanical factors on bifurcation stenosis and uh, thrombosis. That's the, the, the study design. We collect uh, uh, bifurcation lesions, we randomize them to a pot or kissing balloon inflation technique, and we perform detailed intracoronary imaging with OCT before uh, the PCI, right after the PCI, and then in follow-up. Um, and then the whole idea is to use the pre-standing bifurcation geometry, reconstruct it, and uh, replicate in the computational environment what we actually did in the clinical setting. And then we compare the two techniques in terms of like how the anatomical stenosis is different 
um, and how this correlates with the baseline post-intervention biomechanical environment. Um, the study is primarily uh, collecting data from Japan. Uh, we have also one center in France. Let me give you an example of one of our patients from this database. So uh, this is a patient with uh, a Medina uh, 011 left main bifurcation. He um, underwent standing uh, pre-dilatation balloon in the uh, LAD, then standing with a reservoir integrity uh, from the left main to the LAD, and finally kissing balloon inflation. We had OCT data of the both branches, the LAD and the circumflex, uh, before dilatation, right after standing, right after uh, uh, kissing balloon inflation, and finally in follow-up at nine months. Uh, we used a patient-specific approach using exactly the same bifurcation geometry, realistic wall properties coming from the OCT, uh, realistic balloon size, material properties and inflation properties, and finally realistic stand design, uh, uh, stand size, stand material and inflation um, uh, properties. Uh, this is um, the uh, LED uh, disease, uh, as you can appreciate here. Um, the OCT shows nicely the fibrotic stenosis at the ostium of the LED. We did reconstruct uh, uh, the, this uh, geometry uh, using our algorithms, and then this is the pre-dilatation they actually did using this semi-compliant balloon. We used exactly the same balloon, 3 year balloon, uh, deployed at the proximal uh, LED to the left main, and this is the deployment using, um, uh, from another view, uh, we even uh, were able to uh, calculate the, the wall stresses at the bifurcation site. Then this is the stent they deployed, a 3-5-18 resident integrity, and you can appreciate the uh, carina shift towards the circumflex side as the stent is deployed to the, from the left main to the LED. We did use exactly the, stand, the same stent geometry to replicate the same standing technique in the computer. Um, this is the stent deployment, and you can appreciate here how the, the carina uh, is gonna shift to the circumflex with the stand deployment. Same from another view. And uh, those are the post-inflation uh, 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 stresses. Then the post-dilatation technique, kissing balloon inflation with two balloons in the left main uh, uh, to the LED and to the circumflex. And we were able to replicate exactly the same uh, approach in the computer, um, uh, pay, pay attention on the elliptical configuration. We always get into the left main after kissing balloon, and we were able to replicate this in the computational environment. You can appreciate how similar is the computational versus the, the, the real. So at the end of the day, we compared the simulated PCI entirely done in the computer with the actual PCI, and you can appreciate very similar bifurcation angles and uh, morphometric uh, uh, result in the circumflex LED and left main between the two approaches. So this study, the flow SR, um, anticipates to assess the feasibility of bifurcation PCI simulations, the validity, how bifurcation angle, stand uh, uh, expansion, main and side branch uh, dilatation, strata position can influence the, the local dynamics and flow dynamics and restenosis, and primarily help us identify groups of bifurcation anatomies and disease which can better serve by specific standing techniques the so-called optimized bifurcation standing. The good news is that to uh, uh, implement all those, to execute all those approaches, we just need routine data, just on geography, QCA, QCA IVUS, OCT, even uh, CT and geography data, and then uh, as soon as we know wh what exact technique uh, uh, we um, uh, clinically applied, we can do everything offline and uh, do the simulations. The clinical significance of uh, these approaches, the simulation, the computational simulation approaches, is that they can help us optimize the bifurcation stand techniques. They can help us develop new standing techniques and new better stands. Um, it can be very useful in near real-time environment. The so-called autopilot PCI, especially useful for um, non-experts. Uh, it can be a wonderful educational training tool. Nowadays, we learn bifurcation PCIs by trial and error on our patients, and I guess it would be much better to have this uh, experience uh, using computational approaches first before we embark on the patient in a real uh, setting. And of course, those approaches from the bifurcations can be also translated to other vascular beds like the carotids, aortic, or even in the structural interventions. The big uh, next step here uh, is the uh, an outcome study, which is going to compare, and we're in the process of designing this, is going to compare um, in bifurcations a con a, a, the conventional PCI against a, the so-called simulation edit approach, hoping to have better improved outcomes with a simulation plant approach versus the conventional approach. So in conclusion, the bifurcation PCI 
is associated with increased rates of uh, uh, adverse events, and uh, obviously uh, the optimal verification PCI technique is still um, an issue. Uh, anatomy and local biomechanics are major determinants, major factors that determine the bifurcation standard stenosis and thrombosis, and a patient-specific approach, bifurcation standing approach, can uh, provide us with opportunities for better planning of bifurcation standing, optimizing our standing design, and at the end of the day, improving uh, our, our outcomes. So there's a big group of uh, co-investigators from all around the world that I would like to thank here, uh, the steering committee and the groups from uh, Japan, and of course, our funding sources. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This is really like future tips and tricks for bifurcation standing. Excellent. My, we don't, we have, we have, we have, if you're gonna introduce, uh, Manas would like to introduce the last speaker. Yeah, absolutely. Just one quick one question. question. Um, how, how does this simulate, like if you have calcified lesions or tough lesions or something, how can you simulate that in the simulator? Because sometimes you inflate a stent and it really doesn't, or a balloon, it doesn't inflate all the way. So can you, do yes. you have the ability yes. to do that? Yes, absolutely. With uh, the current computer power and, and uh, techniques mm -hmm. using OCT, intracoronary imaging, we can very nicely and precisely uh, reproduce the stiffness of the artery in the computational environment. So all these approaches, patient-specific, bifurcation-specific, plaque-specific. It's not just computational. Awesome. Thank you very much. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Bulakis to introduce our last speaker. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce uh, um, Dr. Joe Healy. He doesn't need an introduction. He's the chief of cardiology at UT Southwestern in Dallas, but also the editor-in-chief of circulation. So wherever any order, he's going to give us uh, literally the last uh, talk in the session for the meeting, having the last word. He has inspired tremendous um, energy and vision and innovation in circulation with particular interest, and maybe I'm overstating it, but I think uh, interventions have been a particular focus for um, Dr. Hill. So we're very excited to hear about where we're going in the next few steps. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure and honor to be here. And, and in truth, I'm here for two reasons. First of all, Subash told me to come. And, <laughs> and number two, I want you to understand that we take our responsibility to meet the needs of the interventional community very seriously. As we do the EP community, the heart failure community, the imaging community, we want to make sure that we are meeting your needs in terms of disseminating the best science that you produce and the science that you need to read. And so that's a, that is an important thing for me to emphasize. Everybody is aware that c diseases around the globe have evolved such that now non-communicable diseases outstrip communicable diseases everywhere, even in India, for example. It, last year, for the first time, it outstripped it in India. As a result, cardiovascular disease, as you are aware, around the world is the number one killer of men and women. Many women don't know that, many women practitioners. One out of four women in the U.S. will die of heart disease. It is a global phenomenon. It is not a Western, developed world phenomenon anymore. It is global. The age-adjusted standardized risk uh, for cardiovascular disease, as you can see, has migrated into the developing world. You can see in the, in the in East, even now, uh, it's uh, penetrating into Africa. One little bit of philosophy. One of the things we as physicians always try to do is cure a disease, eliminating the associated morbidity and mortality. But in fact, it's quite rare for us to cure a disease. We cure some infections and a few cancers. We cure very few cardiovascular disease outside of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So we almost always have to settle for the next best thing, which is if we can't cure it, maybe we can transform it into a chronic disease that can be managed for a long time. When I went to medical school a long time ago, I heard two lectures in a large lecture hall about a syndrome that was emerging in Northern California and in Haiti where young men were having their immune system shut down and they developed unusual infections and cancer and died. It was called the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Nobody had any idea what the cause was, but it was a death sentence. Now, 50% of people with HIV AIDS are over 50 years of age. It has not been cured, but it's been transformed into a chronic disease that can be managed over decades, which is in many ways what we see in cardiovascular medicine. These are age-adjusted, uh, death from MI in the hospital. In the 1960s, if you had a heart attack with a nurse standing beside you, there's a 30% chance you didn't go home. Now in most ho hospitals, uh, it's more like two or 3%. You can see that you're all aware that we've had enormous success in taming the acutely lethal manifestations of cardiovascular disease. We almost crossed with cancer, but now it's been turned up for the last six years, 
And many people believe that we have now ceased to see those gains because of the global pandemic of obesity and associated diabetes, and I'll discuss that further. These, these dramatic improvements in mortality are associated, at least, with many of the developments that all of you are quite expert at, many of the techniques and the drugs and our understanding about smoking and cholesterol and hypertension and so forth. For the early career people in the room, though, I would urge you to think about where it's going to be, not where it is now. It used to be 20 years ago, the CCU was all about acute coronary syndromes. Now it's a lot, a lot of heart failure, right? These people are surviving their MIs and going home with heart failure. The future, again, will evolve in the next 20 years. The practice of cardiology now is very different than 20 years ago, and I challenge you to believe that it'll be different again. This is what the future looks like. Hypertension is a global scourge. There are over 400 million people in China with, with hypertension. Obesity. Obesity is an enormous problem, or again, around the world. You can see it is not just in the West. Um, it is everywhere. And you know, now that I've mentioned China, I will tell you that the, the prevalence of diabetes in the U.S. is 11 percent with this much obesity in North America. If you see how much obesity there is in China, 11 percent, the very same number. 40 percent of people in China, a country of 1.4 billion people, 40 percent have prediabetes. For whatever reason, people of Han Chinese descent are predisposed such that it only takes about 10 extra pounds of weight to predispose them to diabetes, where in other ethnic groups, we get away with much, much more. Nobody knows what that genetic riddle is, an important one to solve. But sadly, obesity, smoking, air pollution, and so forth are taking their toll in the, in the developing world. Uh, again, this illustrates this obesity pandemic literally around the globe will define the future of cardiovascular medicine going forward. My friend and mentor, uh, Eugene Braunwell, said to me, not too long ago, the thrombocardiologist of the 20th century will be replaced by the diabetocardiologist of the 21st century. And I think that's a, a prescient observation that the metabolic consequences of our world impacting atherosclerosis and, and diabetic cardiomyopathy and HEFPEF and so forth. In the developing world, it looks very different. The, the uh, prevalence and incidence of prevalence of STEMI is exploding over there. Fuwai Hospital in Beijing does 100 PCIs a day. The, Stroke and MI are absolutely exploding, whereas in the West, we've seen dramatic changes. So the face of cardiovascular disease is very different in the developed world and in the developing world. So if I may what it suggest what I think the future looks like, first of all, the, the plasticity of the myocardium is astonishing. The way in which the, the myocardium can respond to stresses, preload stress, ischemic stress, me metabolic stress, and so forth, along these lines. At some level, this is what all of cardiovascular disease looks like at the level of the myocardium, the different uh, environmental influences that are impinging on, on the heart. What can we do about it? CRISPR-Cas9, you all know about this gene editing miracle where we can go in and we can alter the genes, we can take out a gene, put in a gene in any tissue of, of our choice, and people are now doing this even in human beings. We are now editing the the genetic blueprint of human beings. I predict that it will be a day in the future when xenotransplantation will replace human transplantation. We'll be putting in not just uh, preserved pig valves, but pig hearts. Um, you may know that pig heart, pigs have retroviruses in their, in their genome, which is one of the major problems. That is, those can be clipped out with CRISPR-Cas9, and their HL antigens can be humanized. I believe that we will see the day when many of the transplantation technologies will be replaced but with xenotransplantation. You're aware that inflammation has been on people's radar for many years in cardiovascular disease, but it, it, it has been along the lines with atherosclerosis thought to be a simmering problem over the course of decades until the time of plaque rupture. This all changed in terms of a therapeutic target, as you're aware, when Cantos was published last August, where it became, inflammation became a bona fide target. IPS cells, where you can take a fibroblast from any body and turn it into a stem cell, and then turn around and make it into a, any cell of your choice, a heart cell, a, a liver cell, or whatever, well, is allowing for precision diagnostics, which is underway currently at the present time, where we can analyze, we can model a disease in a dish from anybody uh, in, uh, in this room. Digital devices, as you are aware, uh, there's a great deal of emphasis with Google and, and uh, Apple and so forth, developing these devices to try and better phenotype our, ourselves and our, and our patients. I believe that blockchain technology will change the way we, we uh, practice medicine. You're, you know what this is. It's 
It's encrypted records that are shared across millions of computers. And there will be a day, I believe, when everybody's medical record will be in the blockchain cloud and you can pull it down in an encrypted fashion and radically change the way in which we practice medicine. Some people think blockchain technology is transform as transformative as the internet. Machine learning uh, is certainly emerging, as you're aware, already in radiology and in echocardiography and, and certainly uh, more and more going forward. Precision medicine, we've already heard about that today, how rather than treating populations, we'll be treating individuals going forward. Cardiac regeneration is a controversial area, um, but I personally am quite convinced that the day will come when we can take a myocyte and trick it into going back into the cell cycle to replicate. As you're aware, the, these cells stop replicating several days after birth, and they're post-mitotic from then on, but there's a lot of progress in, in turning that back around also possibly transforming fibroblasts into myocytes as well. I think both of those have a lot of potential. The microbiome, again, is another big black box that we understand very little about, but clearly without question impacts cardiovascular disease at many levels. So the challenges that we face are enormous. There's no question about it, and I want to emphasize they are evolving. They're different today than they were 20 years ago, and they'll be different again down the road. These challenges include all these things I'll list here. You're aware of this. At the same time, we have amazing tools, unprecedented opportunities with these technologies that I've just mentioned. Ultimately, the future to tame the, the runaway healthcare costs is at the level of research. All of us are practicing physicians, and we will continue to take care of patients day and night. But the only way we can stem the tide of these, this tsunami of cardiovascular disease around the world is at the level of research and turning off and preventing diabetes and preventing uh, atherosclerosis and so forth. So with that, I'll stop and uh, be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. This was very uh, thought-provoking. Nice. I just have a quick question to ask, and then I would like to open for the audience as well, uh, since uh, they get the chance to ask you questions. How do you think med schools are going to be affected by all this to prepare the future generation to be able to do things that we can, hard, as far as I'm concerned, can hardly understand even? Well, you know, you've, you've heard the old phrase that half of what you learn in medical school is wrong. We, we just don't know which half, right? And so, but, you know, the, you know, one of the key elements, as everybody in the room knows, is leaving medical school being able to interpret the literature. The literature is obviously always evolving. So being facile with trying to understand at least the basics of an epidemiological observational study or a randomized controlled trial, understanding something about statistics um, is is absolutely critical. If anything, it's more critical than before because the pace at which this information is emerging is, is accelerating before our eyes. I'd like to open for the audience. If you have any uh, questions or discussion with Dr. Hill, panel two, please go ahead. Yeah, Joe, thanks very much. I love, I love this uh, broad view. And I agree with you, many changes are coming, but there are some components, as you said, like the literature review that are going to remain critical for everyone. For, so for new physicians coming out, cardiologists mm -hmm. or otherwise, apart from the scientific research part, uh, what do you think about the actual day-to-day -day operations and like commitment to care, being punctual, I mean, things like that. What do you think, are these going to change or are there some things that are actually going to be the same as they are now uh, going in the future? I, I personally believe that the physician will never be replaced with a computer. Uh, there are people who disagree with that, but I, um, in my mind, the, the mark of a good doctor is being compulsive and looking under every single stone and leaving no, no stone unturned. I don't think that that's going to change. In, in terms of how you interact with the literature, that's an incredibly important, incredibly important thing. Um, you know, one of our responsibilities in, at circulation in any journal, frankly, is to make sure that we provide the information to you in the way that you'd like to consume it. A few people in this world still like to read print journals, but most people interface with the website or electronic tables of content or podcasts or uh, Facebook. We will provide it to you that way, but please don't use just one. You, you need to be focused on what you're interested in and use whatever mechanisms you like. I urge you to use more than one, but you must read beyond that. You must step out beyond that narrow focus of, and read about things that are at the periphery of your major, in, major level of interest. And another thing, so we have a lot of uh, fellows and young faculty, and of course, you want to publish in circulation. Can you give us any, can you give an advice for people who are early in their careers, fellows or going on, what is the key things Everyone wants to publish, but what are the key things to pay attention that are going to make a difference for being able to get the paper in circulation? Well, the, 
our number one criterion is validity. Is this paper true? If it's not, we're done. It's not going to get accepted. It's not going to get referred. Conversation over. I don't, I don't care if it's going to be a, on the front page above the fold of the New York Times. We, we do that every week. We walk away from papers where we think this is wrong and it's unfixable. Somebody's going to publish it and it'll, be, it'll generate a lot of eyeballs. We're not going to do that. We don't go there. So is it valid? If it's valid, then we will work with you. you know, we will let you know what we think. We routinely, our editors routinely call edi uh, authors on the phone all the time. Manos has done this many, many times. Pick up the phone and say, you know what, we really like your paper, but do you have this control? Or how come you didn't ask this question? Or we don't like this part. And we, we work with you. you know, we're, we're all investigators too, right? I get my papers rejected too, you know? <laughs> so I, I get what it feels like to be on the receiving end of that. And we're, we're human and we will interact with you across the, uh, spanning across the boilerplate of emails, we will, we will work with you to try to make your work as best as possible. And once it's accepted, we will disseminate it ar around the globe as best we can. Um, so it has to be valid, number one. Number two, does it change the way you think about something? There's, there are very few papers that change practice. Every once in a while there's one that changes the way we practice. But at least does it change the way we think about this disease or this technique or this imaging modality? That, that has to be, that no, level of novelty has to be there as well. And if those two things are there, then usually we're ready to work with the authors. Perfect. And I think that's a great point. Uh, to be honest, myself, I didn't realize this before becoming part of the, the group, that actually the journal is not this amorphous, is not that uh, matrix where you have no idea. Actually, it's humans behind this. And you can actually interact with them and ask them. I mean, you can obviously go and say, get my paper and accept it. That doesn't work. But when there's something valid and that's interesting and important, you know, the journal works actually with you. People call you and say, you know, that's the problem. Can you fix it? Because I think we all want to make the better paper. And actually, many authors have been very grateful because what came out at the end was actually much better than what came in. I mean, same concept, but improved so much through this editorial process. So I cannot emphasize this enough. So my own personal research is basic. And so it's pretty easy to tell if something, a basic study is novel or not. You know, it's a new gene, a new pathway, a new molecule. In clinical work, it's less so. And so we make judgment calls. We'll, we'll just, we, every single week, we discuss several papers where this side of the room says, this, is, this changes the way I think, and this side says it's incremental. It's a judgment call at where you cross that divide from incremental to impactful. And that's a human call. We do our best. I bet we get it wrong occasionally, hopefully not often. But we do our best to make that, that judgment. It is, it is a subjective judgment. Any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. It's a partial of my case. Uh, Greg actually talked about this change in the global prevalence of like, STEMI agriculture syndrome. How do you think in the US we can take leverage of the fact that we have people from different ethnic backgrounds and uh, atherosclerosis is not the same in different races? Uh, how do you think we can take leverage of that and be the leader in the world, you know, to study this around uh, different atherosclerosis uh, in different patient populations? Are we doing enough? Well, that's one of the most important riddles, I think, for the next 20 years, is, is why is it that different ethnic groups are predisposed or not? You know, the, I told you about China. You're aware what, what in, the, in the Indian subcontinent, metabolic disease and so forth. Um, you know, we learned about Caucasians at Framingham. The next, next came, that came along was African Americans, largely, the Dallas Heart Study and other things, and Hispanics. But there are many final frontiers yet, including Asians and, and the Indian subcontinent that we just haven't uh, figured out yet. And, uh, and Again, at the level of precision medicine, manifestly, they're, they're very different. As I, as I say, a, a Han Chinese, if I were a Han Chinese and I had 10 extra pounds, I, I'd be predisposed to diabetes. Other questions? Well, thank you very much for an excellent session. Thank you, Dr. Hill, for, for being here. Um, if you guys are not going to catch a plane, please join us in our, the last uh, session, which is uh, an Innovative Cases competition finals. There should be a lot of uh, good cases up in the Colorado ballroom. Thank you for being here so late in the conference. As always, Manos and Group, thank you for a great conference, another year of success. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mazen. Great, great work. And also, 60 people presented their challenging cases, the nine winners are going to present upstairs, and everyone gets a, a, a check at the end, the three winners. So and there's lunch, so feel free to come upstairs. Thank you all for coming to this year, and we look forward to seeing you next year. July 18 to 20 is for next year. Thank you again.